Deep in the woods, loggers cut trees, move logs, and produce lumber. The work is brutal, backbreaking, and dangerous. Falling timber can crush and kill. Mean machines designed to slice and dice thick trees can quickly maim. This is the story of a noble and tough breed. Their blood, sweat, and sacrifice ensured enough wood was cut to build mighty nations. This is Timber, next on Dangerous Mission. Hovering over a magnificent forest in the Pacific Northwest, a helicopter pilot readies to airlift 100-foot logs out of the woods. On the forest deck is a logger, known as a hook tender. His job is to hook the timber onto the long line hanging from the helicopter. Tag's coming up. Tag's up. As he lifts, the pilot balances the ship and logs. If his swinging load gets caught in the thick forest canopy, disaster will strike. Once clear of the treetops, the pilot flies the 3,000 pound load to a central landing zone. Men and women known as choker setters, the ground troops of timber, run in and clear and collect the cable lines. This task, too, is perilous. If a logger gets hit by a log, it could be fatal. Logging is a noble and difficult profession. Success is measured in lumber produced and lives spared. It has continued in much the same way from generation to generation. Timber is cut, collected, and moved. In the 200 years that there has been a logging industry in North America, the machines, methods, and safety standards have all evolved. But the lumberjack's job remains brutal and tough. These modern-day lumberjacks share in a rich tradition. The very first professional lumberjacks marched into the great American forest over two centuries ago. Armed with a sharp axe and a bold spirit, they felled their first trees and created a way of life. The old time loggers, when you talk about pioneer spirit, they had it along with the wagon train people that came out here to develop this country. They were the first, they were the stewards, they were the ones that produced the product to allow the country to be built. The pioneer logger immortalized in the figure of Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox ranged the vast American wilderness. With cork-soled boots, steel spikes, and a swift axe, the lumberjack cleared the timber lumbering the landscape. When an axe wasn't enough, he used a tool called a jack and literally hoisted the tree up and off the stump. Where the lumberjack blazed a trail, civilization quickly followed. When the settlers first hit the shores of America, the forest was an obstacle. It occupied the sites that they needed for growing uh, food. And so they didn't view the forest uh, the same as we do today. It, it was a dark place in many areas that they needed to open up for sunlight so that they could grow crops. And it was seen as pretty intimidating, I think, to most settlers. The first lumberjacks cut the wood that built the towns and cities of the Northeast. By the 1850s, they had forged a path to the Great Lake states. The lumberjacks set up camps and felled the abundant and strong white pines. You have to realize that the first loggers were dealing primarily with hand tools and using sometimes very large trees, trees that would weigh uh, uh, five tons, for example. They invented new ways to cut. The crosscut saw replaced the ax and the big wheel, pulled by horses, helped move logs through rugged terrain. 
the relatively high wages ensured a steady supply of tough, bold, and spirited men to the woods. For most of the 19th century and much of the 20th, on-the-job fatalities were horrifically high. Hundreds died every year in the woods. Experts estimate that at least a logger a day would lose his life in the forest. This grim record has only been significantly reduced in the last few decades. Yes, men were killed quite regularly. You know, a tree can snap. Uh, you can fell a tree and it kicks back instead of falling the way that you predict it will. It'll hang up. A very, very dangerous occupation. Moving the logs to the sawmills was also a deadly proposition and a logistic challenge. However, the creative loggers turned running waterways into fast and free highways. The first trees felled were the biggest and best lining the fertile riverbanks. When those were gone, specially built flumes would shoot logs down to the water. From there, logs ran all the way to a sawmill built downriver. A few lumberjacks took to the water. Carrying a peavey, basically a stick with a hook, they were assigned to clear the frequent log jams. Hopping from one slick rolling log to another, they would hunt for the key log blocking the flow of timber. The lumberjacks, water rats, or they had a lot of different names for them. We'd have to go out there, pick the key log, get it out of there, release the logs so they continue to float downstream. They might float 100 yards, they might float 10 miles, but there were many fatalities in, in that type of work. If men using PVs couldn't free the log jam, explosives would be used. We had powder monkeys, men who had handled the dynamite, and sometimes you get a log jam that's so tight there is no key log, and the powder monkey goes out, puts a bundle of dynamite sticks into it, hopefully has a long enough fuse that he makes it back to shore before it blows, and uh, you'll see logs go sky high. These early lumberjacks cut enough wood to build the first houses, make the first towns, and lay the railroad ties that paved the migration west. They helped build America. We started out to build the strongest country in the world. And uh, over the last couple of hundred years, we've been able to do that. The lumberjacks trail blazing move to the Pacific Northwest would beckon the zenith of the timber industry. To log the giant timbers and survive, the lumberjacks would have to conquer dangerous conditions and deadly challenges. By the 1900s, the lumberjacks began to migrate west. Here in the magnificent forests of the Pacific Northwest, the loggers faced massive spruce, Douglas firs, and redwoods. These tall trees dwarfed anything they had seen or logged in the east. They were five times as tall and five times around at the base, or butt swell. They also had another tough challenge. These giants grew on steep, wet slopes. Undaunted, the resilient logger created new ways to harvest the tall, broad, and heavy timber. One of the things that they had to do, for example, was to climb higher above the butt swell of these trees. So they would use these springboards to climb up the tree and get above the butt swell so that they could operate to cut the tree down with their crosscut saws and axes. The old lumberjack who stood up there with his cork boots on, uh, balancing himself on a springboard, uh, tipping over a 200-foot Douglas fir tree, that was a real man. Wagons pulled by powerful oxen were brought in to move the huge five-ton logs. To support the enormous loads, they built special roads. Logs were half buried in the mud. Loggers regularly greased the wood for a smooth run. These skid roads, as they were called, ran all the way to the mills. Often a town would grow around the mill, and its first road was always known as Skid Row. 
The turn of the 20th century ushered in a new era for the fledgling timber industry. Steam power arrived in the woods of the Northwest and revolutionized production. Special logging trains hauled timber to the sawmill. Here, logs were turned into lumber. First, a mechanical conveyor lifted the huge logs up a chute and into the mill. Then, a steam-powered bandsaw would cut the logs into usable boards. Brave loggers, inches from the deadly blade, rode on the saw carriage. Their job was to line up the log after each cut. Next, a steam-driven machine with revolving blades, called a planer, cut, measured, and smoothed the surface of the boards. The newly carved lumber was then ready to be transported. We had faster cutting techniques and technologies. We were able to transform these logs into units of size that could be moved, and that meant that everything speeded up uh, from the days of, of uh, logging with an ax, a saw, and a horse or an ox. In the 1920s, another steam-powered invention, the Dole Beer Donkey, added to the logger's productivity. This stationary and modified train engine soon became a regular fixture on the logger's landing zone. Its power was used to pull winches that hauled cables attached to felled timber. It allowed the lumberjacks to move logs faster and further. For the loggers on the ground, giant logs, moving, swinging, and flying, increased the threat to their lives. A young logger, known as a whistle punk, would stand by the steam donkey, watch lines, and warn workers of hazards. Former governor of Idaho, Cecil Andrus, started as a logger in World War II. His first job was as a whistle punk. Every fiber in your body was aware that you had the lives of other workers in your hands and that you had to pay close attention and do everything exactly right. The wrong signal from the whistle pump, the wrong move on the, the main line on the donkey uh, could end somebody's life just like that. The arrival of steam power radically transformed the industry. However, not always for the best. Sadly, as the pace of production increased, the number of loggers hit, maimed, and killed by the faster moving timber also rose. In Oregon and Washington, we'd say at least maybe 300 or 350 men might die in a single year. And this was the, probably the most dangerous period that we had during the logging in the 1920s and 30s. It was a depression times, uh, and it was just difficult work. People who could find a job were taking risks, uh, anything to keep a job. In logging, you run in for your job, and you run out for your life. To overcome the steep and rugged terrain, the lumberjacks devised a new technique called high leading. A courageous logger called a high climber would scale a tall tree and put a rigging on the top. The most hazardous part of the high climber's job is topping the tree. He must cut the crown off the tree to make room for the high lead rigging. That's something that you'll never forget. When that tree tips, and starts to go, then you get that, that rocking motion. And uh, it's a little scary the first time, but it's a little addictive too. And I took pride in doing it, and so I, I, that's what I did. This intricate rigging system of pulleys and cables was harnessed to the pulling power of the steam donkey. It could lift logs off the steepest slopes. Steel towers have mostly replaced trees as the pivot for this type of timber pulling operation. But sometimes towers are not available, or the work site is too steep for a machine to safely deploy. In these special cases, high climbers are still called upon to risk their lives to scale and top tall trees. The first time I climbed a tree with uh, climbing gear, I was petrified. You don't think of 30, 40 feet off the ground as being that high until you're suspended by a pair of climbing spurs and a climbing belt. And you tense up, and I had to lean back on the rope and just stretch my hands a few times. 
because I was just so tense. By the 1950s, the labor-intensive crosscut saw was replaced by the gas-powered chainsaw. By the time I got started, we had a big, heavy power saw. Power saws that would take, you could barely carry, and sometimes it took two people. But vibration was terrible, the noise was terrible, and you had, you know, if you got them hung up in the log, they kicked pretty hard, too. They were hard to handle, but they did beat the old handsaw. With the advent of the chainsaw, timber production again increased. However, using a chainsaw can be hazardous. The biggest risk is known as a kickback. If this happens, the chainsaw can rip through flesh in a split second. It takes a heartbeat for a chainsaw to kick back and cut somebody seriously. It, it happens that fast. A chainsaw cut is a lot different than getting cut with a knife. It's a wide open wound. It's a, it's a dirty wound. And so a lot of times they'll get infected and that's what happened to me. Randy, while fatigued, was felling a tree when the chainsaw kicked back and sliced into his leg. To minimize injuries today, loggers wear specially reinforced pants. To help walk on slick logs, they still wear cork-soled and steel spike boots like their predecessors. They take great pride in their ability to cut a tree cleanly and drop it with pinpoint accuracy. They call it hitting a good shot. If you have a real tight shot that you have to hit with a real nice tree and you hit it, it's, it's kind of like winning a game or, or uh, hitting a real good shot in golf or something like that. It, it makes you feel real good. The timber cutter must make precision cuts on both sides of the tree to be felled. We start with uh, putting what we call a face in it, cut a bevel out of it. And when we saw in the back, the face allows the tree time enough to come down without barber chairing, which would be splitting in half. That's dangerous. They can either break off the stump, go uphill, downhill, backwards. It's, it's bad when you barber chair one. <laughs> Once felled, the cutter measures the tree. He will then cut it to the exact length requested by the sawmill that is buying the lumber. The cutter is on the front line of the logging operation. While chainsaw wounds are serious and can be lethal, most deaths in logging happen when trees fall. Then they have the potential to drop and crush a worker to death. I don't want to see my son out here. There's always a chance, you know, and it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's just when and where, and if it's going to get you. I've had some really close calls, but I've been lucky. On this contemporary logging site in Oregon, a 90-foot steel tower stands in the place once occupied by the high lead trees. This mighty machine is a cable yarder. It is anchored by its own weight and a spider's web of guy lines. A standard piece of equipment on a modern logging site, the yarder has drums on the sides that dispense high tensile steel cables. On a given signal, the skilled yarder operator will haul the logs to the landing zone. Oh, it's awesome. It feels like you can pull the world over if you want to. You can feel the weight on the whole machine. The heavier the turn and the harder I pull, the machine actually trembles. It'll kind of give you the same thrill as driving a race car sometimes. Loggers called chasers and choker setters are in the war zone. At one end, they hook chokers on the logs to be dragged. The yarder hauls the logs down the slope to the landing zone. Chasers must unshackle them and make sure they don't get hit by flying logs. It is dangerous, and you know, people do get hurt out here and get killed, you know. It's hard to work, you know, if you lose a man out here. You know, we try to get through the day because we're all kind of a team. Once on the landing zone, 
loggers go in with chainsaws and cut branches and limbs off the logs. Known as bucking, they prepare the logs for loading. Next, the loader operator hoists the bucked logs off the deck and onto a truck bed. On a good day, 15 to 20 trucks are loaded. On this job, the logs are unusually large. The bigger ones you can uh, definitely tell because it'll pick the back end of the machine up on the big ones. And then you have to get them right in close to you and sometimes one end them if they're, you know, we've had a few of them up here that we've had to put one on one end at a time. Echoing the early glory days of logging, these modern lumberjacks are especially proud of the huge logs they have been harvesting. There's some real satisfaction in getting a big log to the landing and then getting it on the truck. It's the ultimate in logging is, is logging big wood. And so there's a lot of pride. On a nearby logging operation, the yarder and its lines have been rigged to fly logs across a steep-sided valley. This skyline operation lifts logs 500 feet into the air and runs them a mile across to a landing zone perched on one side. This is about as extreme a logging as I think you're going to see anymore. You're looking at uh, the percentage of the slope, having to full suspend across the, the, uh, the creek in the bottom, and then having to run a haul back to get our carriage back. Like I say, this is about as uh, the toughest shows that, that we've seen for this yarder. Choker setters, working in lethal conditions, scramble and scale the difficult terrain. The torrential rain makes the ground especially slick and their task even more treacherous. The main thing is uh, slips and falls or, or something rolling on them on that deep ground. They've got to be very, very aware of uh, anything as far as any loose logs ab above them or any rocks rolling and uh, also a uh, line, possibility of a line breaking and then having the lines come down on them. It could be devastating. I mean, it can cut you right in half if, if, it ever, if it ever hit you. Loggers know that when they enter this back-breaking profession, they risk fatal injury. However, losing a friend, a fellow worker, is something no one can truly prepare for. A friend of mine was falling timber on a Saturday, and we left, got finished with what we were doing, and the two cutters kept working. And before we got home, we heard on the radio that they needed help, that one of them was seriously injured. So we turned around and came back up the hill and uh, got there, and, and a, a good friend of mine died that day, and I, I miss him, you know, a, a lot. A huge tree fell on Randy's friend, and he died from the internal injuries sustained. With many logging sites in remote and mountainous areas, getting help to injured workers becomes a race against time. In these extreme situations, helicopters are used to evacuate victims. Even minor injuries here can turn fatal. Working in the wilds also exposes lumberjacks to external and natural hazards. The most terrifying is the possibility of a wildfire. It can be pretty dangerous. You get with a bunch that doesn't know what they're doing, you can get caught up in the top somewhere and have fire all around you. But you really don't have an understanding of a forest fire until you're in one. The sounds crackling wood, the fire burning, the wind that's created. Uh, something that amazed me was how trees would go up so quickly. Uh, a Douglas fir tree is just full of green needles. But if they're exposed to enough heat, those needles will dry out, and when the spark gets to them, that tree will just explode. It's just like lighting a sulfur match. While wildfires remain a constant threat, it was a political firestorm that nearly killed the lumberjack and his way of life. In less than a century, innovations and inventions like steam, the chainsaw, high leading and cable yarding revolutionized timber production. 
The new methods and machines made it possible to cut vast quantities of wood very quickly. Some experts estimate that by 1980, nearly two-thirds of the original American forest, nearly 500 million acres, had been cut. The economic boom that began with the end of World War II and continued for decades vastly increased the public's demand for lumber. By the late 1980s, the controversial clear-cutting method of production was in full swing. Forests were systematically cleared of all trees. The public was outraged and the logger demonized. First, let me point out to you, it's not the lumberjack that was the demon. It was society and the demands and the methodology that were used. The lumberjack was an employee who was working to sustain himself and his family. He was doing what the foreman told him. He was doing what society demanded that he do. These are family men. These are regular guys that get up in the morning, uh, operate a piece of equipment, fall trees, they go home at night, and that's how they, they support their families, and that's, that's how they make it in the world. The controversy has led to major changes in the way timber is cut. By the early 1990s, pressure from government agencies and new legislation transformed logging practices. Today, the majority of timber cutting is done by small family-run companies. They have new techniques, use radical machines, and get the job done safely and responsibly. These 21st century lumberjacks see themselves as stewards of the forest resource. In the process, they must risk their lives to achieve their extreme and select timber cutting mission. The Pew family of Northern California is cutting a few selected trees in this allotment. This timber cutting technique is called thinning. Using chainsaws and timber cutting machines, they select and cut the smaller trees in this forest. Like surgeons of the woods, they take special care not to break or scar the aspen trees they aim to protect. This innovative practice allows today's steward lumberjacks to promote tree growth, save wildlife, and prevent forest fires. The uh, environmental community and the timber industry have come together and we believe the only way to save the forest is to thin it. On this thinning operation, the Pew family is working to return this stand of trees to its former glory. This is from 1945. This is a picture quite like what we're looking at above us here on the hillside is uh, what it looks like now. Obviously the trees are of a different size, but we've left all the superior trees, the best growing, the tallest, the dominant trees. Now with this, releasing it, giving it the sunlight, the water, this will take off. The Pew's task here is critical. They are cutting the smaller trees to prevent a deadly forest fire. These small trees underneath the larger trees are just a ladder for the fire to come from the ground right on up into the big trees. Also, this particular project here is located near the town of Portola and lots of houses. And so part of this project is to protect it from wildfire. Randy Pugh is a second generation logger and continues a family tradition of innovation. His father, Carl, followed a selective practice known as salvage logging. I always was in the salvage logging business, taking logs out that was either bug infested or was dead or dying. And we always had a real small operation. We never had a large operation. Well, we always salvage log, and I was very proud of that, like we're proud of the thinning work we're doing now, because we utilized something that was dead and dying and would go to waste, and also we reduced the fuel in the wood. So it wasn't so much the idea of cutting a big tree. Now it's more of an ideal utilization and doing the right thing in the woods. At the Pew family's landing zone, the biggest logs are sent to the mill, while the smaller trees and branches are fed into a machine called a chipper. 
The valuable wood chips it spits out go to a power plant. There, they will be used as fuel to generate electricity. Randy's son, Jared, is the third generation of pews to work in the woods. Yeah, it's in my blood. I like doing it. Just learning everything. I like being out in the woods. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. Third generation. It's, I've been around it my entire life. And you just feel, you feel big, you feel tall, you got the chainsaw on your hand, and you feel tough, and just want to go do it again. Logging as a family business is very common in the timber industry, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. However, this rich tradition has painful drawbacks. In the Northwest, uh, fathers taught sons and nephews to log, and they entered them in the business. But they were also exposed to the hazard. And I've known loggers whose sons have been in the business and were vibrant young men and suffered an accident or a fatality. And that changes the way people look at life because it's very difficult to bury a nephew or a son. In recent years, fatalities and injuries in the industry have been dramatically reduced. This is largely due to the mechanization of the logging process. Getting as many men off the ground and into protected calves is a key to worksite safety. On this thinning operation in Oregon, there are no loggers on the ground. Two men and two machines cut, collect, and move the timber. Safety is paramount in our company. Safety comes first, always, and production comes second. If I was producing the same volume of wood a decade ago, I would have at least seven people on the ground. While having those seven people on the ground, they would be exposed to all kinds of hazards that we are not exposed to today. This is plexiglass, and it's about 9 sixteenths of an inch thick, and it is made to take the hit of a log sliding off the back end there, and I've had them slide right down and hit this window before. It gives you quite a thrill for a moment. <laughs> Here? A mean cutting machine known as a single grip harvester plods through the woods. The operator uses its King Kong-like paw to grip the tree. He then lowers a blade and rips through the tree selected for harvesting. And during that process, it will fall the tree, delimit, cut it to exact lengths and diameters and never turn loose of the tree until it's completely processed, hence the word single grip harvester. Once the harvester has cut, bucked, and sliced the trees, a machine called a forwarder rolls in. He will pick up the logs, sort them to their destinations, bring them to a landing area, and then load them on a, a waiting truck or a, a set out trailer, and those will be shipped to the mill and be processed. I'm just finishing up binding these down, and uh, he put about three more logs on me to bring my weight up so I have a full load on, and now I'm ready to go to town. On a nearby logging site, the Luato family has largely mechanized their operation. This allows them to minimize dangers and maximize production. On this job, the Luatos use the latest and greatest of all cutting machines. This 300 horsepower, half million dollar monster is known as a feller buncher. It cuts and collects trees swiftly and efficiently. Feller buncher with a hot saw on it, it's a 30 inch hot saw. It cuts the tree in about two to three seconds. It'll cut up to a diameter of about 28 to 30 uh, inch tree. When the filler buncher finishes cutting and moving timber, loggers go to work. On this site, choker setters are still needed on the ground to shackle logs for the yarder. Replacing the man and the chainsaw, a logger in a cab operates a processor.
It takes the felled logs and delimbs them with savage speed. Echoing the family logging tradition, Bob Luato's son Kirk has joined the team. That makes me feel good. He's going to be the fourth generation Luato that's going to come into the uh, business. And uh, I was with my dad, and my dad was with his dad. So it's, it, it's a good feeling. It's something I've always wanted to do all my life. Um, ever since I was a little kid, I've always wanted to be out in the woods with my dad, just learning what he knows, I mean, following in his footsteps. To satisfy demand and meet environmental standards, today's lumberjack must be willing to go farther, higher, and steeper to cut timber. When thinning is needed in treacherous conditions, the helicopter is the weapon of choice. However, the world of helicopter logging is fast, furious, and fraught with danger. High above the glorious woods of the Pacific Northwest, a helicopter pilot carefully positions his ship. He is preparing to airlift timber off the forest floor. In a perilous operation known as helicopter logging, the pilot dangles a 200-foot long line down into the dense stand of trees. Like a fisherman of the forest, he waits anxiously for a bite. Tag coming up, tag up. Bob Grimm is director of operations on this show. The pilot has a lot of different concerns while he's uh, performing the tasks here involved with logging. He has a 200 foot long line attached to the bottom of the helicopter, which extends his hazard zone well beyond the helicopter itself. He has to make sure that, that the long line under him as well as the helicopter is clear of any obstructions. There's a number of different hazards connected with flying with a long line. On the ground, a logger has the task of hooking the timber to the long line. He has only seconds to get out of harm's way. When hooked, the pilot hoists his load through the crowded forest canopy. Welcome to one of the world's most dangerous jobs. Mechanical failure or drastic weather changes can also prove deadly for the pilot. It's always been a dangerous job. Looking out over the forest, if anything goes wrong with the helicopter, there's no place to go but down, and there are no landing zones or any safe places for the helicopter pilot to sit down. Free of the forest and the trees, the pilot balances and flies his turn of logs to the landing zone. In the aircraft, I mean, every little, little thing you touch or every little move the logs make, because we're just suspended in midair, uh, it, you, you feel it all. This pilot and chopper are used to the pressure. Both are Vietnam veterans. The helicopter is a UH-1 Huey with a powerful 1,300 horsepower engine. It can haul loads as heavy as 4,000 pounds. We'll actually start around 3,200 pounds, and then as he burns fuel off, we can pick up more material the weight replaces the weight of the fuel that's been burnt. Airlifting logs is not new. As early as the 1950s, surplus World War II barrage balloons were used. They could lift trees weighing up to eight tons. In the 1960s, hot air balloons were used to lift old growth timbers. They could haul massive 25,000 pound loads but their lack of maneuverability soon made them obsolete. By the 1970s, helicopters began to be used in logging. The pilot's ability to move his craft on a dime and pluck selected trees made this an important practice. Their speed was also an advantage. Helicopters are very fast. Our cycle time can be anywhere from a minute and a half to two minutes, typically around two minutes. That's only half of what goes on on the landing. Those logs also have to be picked up by the loading machine and, and set around. So you have a constant amount of motion, and there in itself lies some of the danger in helicopter logging. 
On the landing zone, it takes but a second to get hurt. You just gotta make sure you keep your eyes on the helicopter and the loader at the same time, because in the loader there's really not a whole lot of visibility, so it's your job just as much as it is his to watch out for yourself. In the helicopter, the same thing. It's just both your jobs to watch out so no one gets hurt. Here in the logging trenches, the choker setters clear and coil cables. With a rookie logger, life-threatening danger is everywhere. Dropped logs can roll and crush. Flying hooks and cables can smash and slash workers. When I first started out, I was scared. I was scared of the hook. I would run, run, run. I spent more time running away from everything. And then I got, you know, so I wasn't scared of it anymore. But yeah, I was scared at first. I found a clearing spot at all times, and that's where I ran to. Spent a lot of time running. Once the pilot has landed the turn of logs, he rotates out to get another load. He will continue to fly turns until his fuel runs out. Typically, that means he will be in the air for an hour at a time. With safety a major concern, the pilot flies a maximum of eight hours a day. The routine is fast and simple, but still, with lives on the line, the pilot must prepare for the unexpected. You know, 99% of the time you're bored, the other percent of the time is sheer terror, but it, it, it's, uh, it's something you learn to live with, and if we didn't love it, we probably wouldn't do it. Ecological concerns and the loggers' desire to better manage the forest's resource makes helicopter thinning a valuable practice. It allows modern lumberjacks to conserve the timber stock and still make a living. It is in the vanguard of environmentally responsible logging techniques. Today's airborne lumberjacks take great pride in their 21st century role. We feel that we are stewards of the land, that we're actually part of this land. And we care deeply about what goes on on our forests, and we want to see the best job possible done while still providing a, a raw material for the rest of the nation. We want to be able to come in and take uh, uh, some material out of this forest and leave behind a healthy forest for the next generation to work in and, and for uh, people to come out and recreate in and, and enjoy. While present day lumberjacks use innovative practices and savage machines to get the job done, they still need brute strength and raw courage to hook, cut, and buck trees. They belong to a long, proud, and tough lineage that stretches back centuries. For over 200 years now, noble lumberjacks have ranged the great forests. On their unbending backs, mighty nations were built. In the process, thousands gave their labor, their passion, and their lives. You take some pride in being able to do a dangerous job, do it well, and do it safely. Oh, it's awesome when you get a, a massive turn of logs and you're up there and you're fighting it, and it makes it, and you see stuff busting and dirt flying and sweat's pouring. It's cool. I think it keeps me young. You know, it, it's right up there with a fast motorcycle. It's it's. I can't imagine doing anything else. <laughs>